many Indigenous people from Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Now, in my current role, sorry, I think I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Karen, <laughs> I just realized this. I'm Karen Reed, I got all excited. Uh, I'm Karen Reed, I'm the acting principal here at Innes College, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to Innes College today. So, uh, I'm only in this role for, for a year, and I started in July, and I've, been to, I've now been to multiple events where I've been asked to read this land acknowledgement, and I have to say, each time I read it, I find myself reflecting on a different aspect of it. And I, to, it's, it's easy, I think, to feel appreciative of the land that we live on, especially when you see it blanketed with beautiful snow on an evening like tonight, or when the sun is shining. Uh, but today I found myself thinking more about the people who've gone before us on this land, and the, responsible, and the responsibility we have, or, the, or I have, to the people who've gone before to make our own contributions, or my own contributions, to help lift up future generations. And uh, it, with these thoughts, I'm, I'm looking forward to the, our guest speaker this evening. But before we get to that, it's my pleasure to introduce Sita uh, Ramkalawan Singh and invite her to the podium. Sita has been a volunteer, a city builder, feminist, student, university lecturer, researcher, human rights advocate, publisher, student leader, public servant, and, and city councillor. Her list of contributions over the years to national organizations, to City Hall, and to the neighborhoods here in the City of Toronto is extensive, and I'm not going to read all of them. But selfishly, I'm going to highlight some of her contributions to the University of Toronto and to Innes College. As a student, Sita was instrumental in the founding of the Women and Gender Studies at the University of Toronto. She has served on the Innes College Council for a number of years. More recently, she co-chaired a Black Student Experience Working Group that developed a set of recommendations that the college is continuing to work on and, and implementing. And most relevant this evening, uh, Sita currently serves as the chair of the Harold Innes Foundation. So please join me in welcoming Sita to the podium to introduce our guest, Ayu Peter. Uh, can you hear? I was having trouble hearing Karen. Thank you, Karen, for your very generous introduction. I didn't think this was going to be about me. Um, <clears throat> but I'd like to uh, thank not just you, but the entire staff team at Innes College who helped organize tonight's session. As Karen indicated, I'm here on behalf of the Harold Innes Foundation. Several directors are here, some more are online, and I'm really glad that I'm able to work with you to organize these lectures. As some of you may know, the college is named after Harold Innes. <clears throat> And I understand that it's the only college of the university named after a former professor. Innes was a remarkable scholar, and the foundation recognizes his contribution to knowledge in two ways. One is through the scholarships that the foundation has endowed here at Innes College, but more, um, <clears throat> more significantly in terms of tonight, uh, through the annual Harold Innes Lecture. Lecturers are asked to respond to the ideas of Harold Innes, his work on trade, communications, political economy. Our previous lecturers have been, more recently that is, have been George Eliot Clark, Andrew Coyne, Jesse Wente, Charlotte Gray, Dion Brand, David Miller, and tonight joining this illustrious group of public intellectuals is Ayu Peter. I first met Ayu in 2007 on an Adventure Canada trip to the Eastern Arctic. I was invited by a mutual friend of ours, Margaret Atwood, who regrets she could not be here in person, but Margaret, has kindly offered to give us a video introduction. So on that note, can we cue up the introduction?
Hello, my name is Margaret Atwood, and it's my great pleasure to be introducing IU Peters uh, for her talk at Innes College today. You're very lucky to have IU. She is a unique individual. Uh, and I'll tell you just one story about her that I heard from some fellow travelers who had been to the Arctic with her. So they were all on the beach and along came a polar bear and they scrambled into their zodiacs and pushed off. But Ayu remained on shore. She walked towards the bear and she sang to it. I don't know whether it was a charmed bear or a confused bear, but it um, went the other way. So that's Ayu, she's pretty ferocious. And I have known her since the early part of the 21st century. And here's a poem that I wrote with Ayu in it. It's called, The Third Age Visits the Arctic. Um, Ayu was often on these, these trips done by Adventure Canada, and this is one of the ones that I remember quite well. Off we go, unsteadily down the gangway, bundled up in our fleecy layers, mittened like infants, breasting, as they once said, the icy waves in our inner tube of a boat, so full of pills we rattle. We're what the French politely call the third age, one and two behind us, four still tactfully not mentioned, though it looms. It's the one after. Meanwhile, we scream full throttle as the spray hits us, delighted to be off the hook, not responsible. Ayu is one of our minders. She's got her sealskin parka on for the camera folk, toting her bear gun. She gives us a strict look sideways. She's seen too many like us to find us truly droll. Hurting us will be like hurting lemmings. We'll wander off. Plus, we don't listen. We've bumbled ashore now. Time for lessons. Jane's up today, she says. When you see a creek like this one, flowing into a bay, and there's flat land for a tent, and a view of the sea for hunting, and berry bushes, a hillside full, you know there must have been people. And sure enough, see here, a ring of stones, a fox trap, and farther on, a grave. Thick slabs to keep out the animals. They like it when you visit them, says Ayu. Just say hello. So we lie down on the soft moss, gaze up at the sky marbled with cloud and a raven circling, and it's total peace among the voices that do not speak. Except we can't stay here. We need to do more real life, see the thing through. So back we amble in our clumsy boots and Gore-Tex wind gear, trundling over the boulders like huge old children called back to school. I is perched on a distant hill to keep us harm-free. She stands on one foot, lifts her arms, a silent message. Hello, I'm here. Here is where I am. I stand on one foot, too. So I was going to be talking to you about communication, and I've just read you a poem about are you communicating. I'm sure you will all enjoy yourselves very much. This is a picture of Ayu, which I took on that, pic on that trip in 2007. And <clears throat> I pulled it out of my photographic records because it reminded me so much of what Margaret had to say about Ayu. There she was, standing on guard for us, and it was... Without further ado, I give you Ayu Peter. I'd like to meet her. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Koyan namik damani gunagase inutaka tutsang itu galaw kisi ani tunga supunga. Thank you all for coming. And thank you for inviting me. I knew that 
it was a welcoming people that I was coming to at Innes College. But this morning, when I stepped outside, I knew you guys were really welcoming because there was snow. <laughs> How did you do that? I need to find that out. That was very nice. Thank you. So, Ma Margaret, um, very nice, very nice woman. I started working with Adventure Canada in 2001. Mind you, I had a letter from the law department saying, if you want to start school, this is the time. I chose Adventure Canada. So I was sailing um, across the Canadian Arctic and Greenland, and there was Margaret. Of course, I didn't know who Margaret was. I wasn't reading into the kind of books that she was writing, and after having looked at some books, when I, went, when I met Margaret, I said, I don't like your books. I think that's how we became friends for a long time. Because she knew I was, I was not there because of her books. I was there to help her clear off the tables on ships. In those days, we had to all clear tables before people sat down to talk. So I was sitting years later after law school. I did attend law school. Years later, I saw on my internet, oh, Tina Turner is coming to Toronto to sing. And I wrote to Margaret, Margaret, let's go and see Tina Turner. And sure enough, I came down. We were sitting almost able to touch Tina Turner. But I'm a smoker, so I would say, she's my bodyguard sitting beside me. I would say, Margaret, I need to go for a smoke. Here's my advice to you. Don't hire her to be your bodyguard because... As we are trying to walk out, everybody wants their picture with her. They want her autograph, so don't hire her. <laughs> Anyways, that was a great, great concert. It was fantastic. And now, with my friends, uh, when they say, oh, do you know her? Oh, yeah, I went to a concert with her, and she's my masseuse. Who? Yeah, she is my mother. She is fantastic. Very kind, very kind person. The title is Twice Colonized. Only because I like doing things to the extreme. I was colonized once. I had to go and be colonized twice. So there you go. I was born in Greenland. What I'll talk to you about tonight is um, growing up in Greenland in 1960s going to school in Denmark in the 70s, moving to the Canadian Arctic in the 80s, and then the, what I have experienced and what I have learned from the Inuit of the Canadian Arctic and how things are today. So in 1960, I was born in the northern part of Greenland called Akisonyak in the Disco Island. How many of you have been to the Arctic? Nice. Uh, with the taxi driver, I was driving over here, and he was asking, so how long is the winter? I said, about 10 months. And he asked, how, how do you get everything up north? Well, we get a ship in the summertime. We have two, three months where you can sail. Mind you, because of climate change, that's become longer. And Everything else is flown in by plane. He was very interested, interested in that, and his next question was, what's the difference between Aboriginal people and Indigenous people? I said, it's, it's the same thing. Uh, times have changed, and now today we call ourselves Indigenous people, so you will hear the term Indigenous people more often. So I'm in, an indigenous person from Greenland. I went to school. My first grade was in my own language, which is Kalatishut, Greenlandic. And in my second, third, and fourth grade, I was being taught in Danish. Because by that time, there was a policy in Greenland 
that demanded that we should all be, become Danishized. We should all learn the Danish language. We should all learn everything about Denmark that had colonized our island. That started in 1721 with a minister named Hans Eger who came to touch base with the Norse people. The Norse had come around year 1000, descendants of the, the Vikings, and Eric the Red, you may have heard of him, and his whole family and delegation. By around 1350 to 1500, the little ice age had come to Greenland, and the temperature of Greenland had changed a little bit. So the Norse, who were living on their cows and, and sheep, and they're uh, not hunting like the indigenous people, had to either move out or uh, disappeared. I claim we ate them all, but the historians will say that's not true. <laughs> you didn't eat them all. So my people came from the Arctic, uh, Alaska, over Canada, and then to Greenland, and that happened around year 1000. So you'll see the Inuit, my ancestry, coming from the north, and the north, north here, we have stories about their interactions. But because we are adapted to living in the Arctic, and because we live off the animals in the Arctic, and we make use of the snow and the cold, we survived. And there, my ancestry has been there, so Hans Eger comes to have contact with the Norse people that they hadn't had contact with for hundreds of years, only found Inuit, Greenlandic Inuit. Oh, what the hell. I'll just Christianize these heathens. He called us heathens. And we are called Galathlit because we were called Skalinga in the Danish language which was a derogatory term at the time, but today we are called Galatlit because Hans Eyre came in 1721. You could say that we've been colonized in Greenland for 300 years. So when you move over to the Canadian Arctic, the first missionary, Reverend Peck, came in the late 1800s. There's a picture of my children's grandfather number five, who was one of the first people to be Christian by uh, Reverend Peck. That picture was from 1910. When the missionary is Christian Inuit, they, they didn't take their names. They changed, they baptized them into a different name. So my children's grandfather number five, his name was Dulugartjua, which means big raven. So when he was Christian, his name was Peter, hence my last name, Peter. So when I love my husband, I'm going all over the map. Just hang on, it will all make sense. So when I left my husband in many years ago, and being a Tina Turner fan, she kept her married name, so I did the same. So I'm, are you Peter? Now, back to my story of Greenland. Going to school in grade two, three, four, we only had a Danish teacher. We didn't speak Greenlandic. That was okay, because our parents still were only, my mother was only speaking Greenlandic, and my brothers were speaking Greenlandic, so I still had that Greenlandic. There was no, we didn't even think about it, that harm would come afterwards. That was not, the f number one concern was that we should become Danish. We should learn everything about our future, education in Danish. We need to be uh, having good jobs and have a good education. So when I was 11, I was a group of six students that were sent off to school in Denmark. There are trees in Denmark, there are cars, there's electricity, there's running water. What struck me was brushing my teeth. I had never brushed my teeth. Because the family I was um, placed in, it was a dental couple. We were dentists. Yeah. 
I had to brush my teeth three times a day. And then we had to sit at a table with a fork and a knife and everybody sitting and having our food. Nothing like the food that I was used to. We could see what kind of food we were having. It was fish or seal or whale or tea or biscuit. That's, that's all we were having. And everybody spoke Danish. I was only learning to speak in Danish and then being taken away, how they assimilated us really well. They're very smart. They would place us separately. We never saw each other again. So you were all by yourself in an all Danish family, only speaking Danish. And then in school, when they sent you to school, you were learning Danish. And using only Danish, you were learning English, German, French, and Latin. It was not till I came back when I was 18 to, to be with my mother and my parents, my siblings. I couldn't speak with my mother. It struck me incredible many years after because until that time, until recently, I blamed myself for not being able to speak with my mother. And it hit me. How come nobody taught me Greenlandic? How come I wasn't taught anything about my own culture? On hindsight, 2020, your vision, that would have been the thing to do. You wouldn't have thousands and thousands of Inuit and then thousands more on the Canadian side or million indigenous peoples not being able to pass on their own language and their own culture. It w I would have really appreci I appreciated the um, learning, new culture, new people, new way of doing things, so many things that I learned but I would really have appreciated learning my own language also so that I wouldn't be so foreign in my own home when I went back home. So in the early 80s when I went back home after going to school in Denmark, after graduation, I realized, and my parents had moved to yet another place. So every time since I was small, we were always moving. My father was a minister, not a minister, he was a teacher and a dean, and we had to move every year or every few years to a new place. And in Denmark, at the time they had sent me to go to school in Denmark, the policy was you could only stay three months in one place, new surroundings, new school, new everything, and then they moved you somewhere else for funding through the Ministry of Greenland. Some places I had stayed up to three, three years, but it was always new schools, new surroundings, new experiences. There's that saying, which I don't agree with, sometimes it goes, what won't kill you will only make you stronger, or more confused, I would add, or I could use so many excuses for the kind of behavior I display sometimes. However, today I really appreciate all the learning and all the teaching I received in all those different environments and circumstances. That's a really good skill to have. So I went back to Greenland, and a year later, in 1979, um, the Alaskans, Epson, had formed a group, an organization, Inuit Circumpolar Council, and their first meeting was in 1979, which took place in Nuuk. I was blown away. Going to school in Denmark, I had never heard any story about my own background, about my own people, even that there were other Inuit living in the Arctic. I was so amazed seeing other Inuit who were not Greenlanders, but who were Canadian or Alaskan. At the time, they didn't allow Russian Inuit to join us in the council, um, in the gatherings. But I took the first Inuk 
guy from Canada walking, I literally took him. People laugh at this, and you're supposed to laugh at this point. I literally took him, and then I moved to Canada in 1981. I was really impressed that there were Inuit who were the same people over the history, over the 100-year history, over 500 years. We were descended from the same people. We had the same language. And I moved to the Canadian Arctic. That was my salvation. In Greenland, when I had come back in 1978, when I was 18, I was scolded for not being able to speak my own language. I was, I was told that I was a cookie. I was brown on the outside and white on the inside. That made me very angry and hurt. But I took that anger, and when I moved to the Canadian Arctic, I really swallowed everything I could of the Inuit language and of the customs. The, the difference was I was allowed to be different. I was allowed not to know the Inuit language, which is called Inuktitut, on the Canadian side. So every single word I learned, I, people were applauding. People were so happy I was able to start speaking and learning the language and sewing and the culture because it was a safe place for me to learn. People welcomed the fact that I was learning as opposed to in Greenland because I was Greenlandic. I should be ashamed for not being able to speak my own language. That was never taught to me in all those languages that I was learning in Europe. And because I, I, I found that it was not my choice to lose my own language, it was not my choice to, to lose my culture, when I moved to the Canadian Arctic, I was very protective of their hunting rights. I was very protective of the language of Inuit and then passing it on to the younger generation. Four years after I had moved to the Canadian Arctic, mind you, I moved with my now then-to-be husband, and we moved in with his parents, and they were only unilingual. They didn't speak any English, so I had to learn to speak English. Four years later, I remember sitting there with my mother-in-law, interpreting for her, and I was like, how did this happen? It was like Scott had beat me down to earth, and I was finding myself speaking her language and interpreting for her. She was setting up a shelter for women and a food bank so people could have um, get food. And after that, it was just collecting, learning, collecting, learning the Inuit language and Inuit practices, but I also had to learn English. The English I learned in school in Denmark was just read. You just read it. It's, it's a good start, but you really have to be in a country. Um, I took everybody's jokes literally. You know when you are trying to tell a joke to another culture, they don't get it? That was me. I, took, I was ready to fight people because I didn't understand the jokes, but now... Now I do. That took, that took some time to learn English, but my main interest was because I had lost my own language, I had lost my own culture, I was collecting so many stories from the elders. What were the traditional laws? How do Inuit interact? What is the marriage? What are the relationships with the animals? I learned that you don't fight. For instance, I was just talking at the SEAL Summit in Newfoundland just a few days ago, and the message from our elders is, you do not fight when it comes to animals. You do not fight with other people or with other groups when it comes to animals. It's not that the animals will disappear. They will be offended. They will, they will go someplace else. So we try to not fight. Therefore, in, since 2007, 
when I've been going to Europe to protest their anti-sealing campaign, I do not employ the tactics of the animal rights groups. We do not take up arms. We do not blow ourselves up. We do not scream our heads off. We love seal. I love seal. I love the meat. I love the fur. But I am not in love with the seal. That's the difference. I follow the teaching of our, our elders that say you have to talk. You have to be kind. You have to come to an understanding. Because what we've been saying since the animal rights group started, and this when I went to Europe in 2007, and in the early 60s, 70s, and 80s, with the um, Americans and the Marine Mammal Protection Act 50, 60 years ago, there was 1.5 million hub seals. Today, the number is between 7 and 10 million hub seals that consume seven to 10 million ton of fish in a year. We were saying this all this time, but we, we say it in a way that is calm and that is not, um, ang I mean, loud, angry. And now we are realizing, yes, what we were saying all along was true. So that's how, that's what I learned from the Inuit, kindness and welcoming being able to talk and not fighting about, about the animals. I think we are the only people in the Arctic that haven't gone to war. We try to be kind, we try to be understanding, and try to listen. Because the other person that you're talking to has, has the same feelings and understands, and if you can talk together, that's the best. Then, in 2000, early 2001, as uh, Margaret was saying, I get a phone call that, that says, Ayo, how would you like going to Greenland? Because I had already moved 20, 20 years earlier, I had moved to the Canadian Arctic. And getting the opportunity to come back to Greenland was very exciting to me by boat. So I joined the Adventure Canada ships and became one of the staff. And we sailed to Greenland. That was amazing. 2001, 35 years earlier, I had been in a, my first grade school was in Ititlip in northern part of Greenland, in a tiny, tiny community. How many people are there in Itiklok, Magic? 138. There was a family, I was just there. They had moved, so maybe about 130. <laughs> 35 years earlier, when I had left that community, it had not changed. What's happening in the smaller communities, as you also may know down here yourselves is um, the younger generation is moving away to larger centers, larger communities. That tiny community had not changed. So we arrived Sunday morning, early, early morning, 35 years be before on that trip. And this little old lady is walking down the hill with a little water bucket because there's no running water. You have to fetch your own water. And she recognized me. I was just a little grade one when I had left. And she recognized me. She told me who my parents were. She remembered my siblings. It was so amazing. Having, having moved away for so many years and then her coming down there was nobody else up because there had been a, a wedding the night before, so everybody was sleeping. That was so nice. And all the trips since then have been amazing to all the different communities in the Canadian Arctic and then also in Greenland. The gun you saw in the picture was just for decoration. I'm not a really good hunter. I just it, I just use it to get me to Greenland. 
my son, who is a really good shoot, shot, got me to shoot 450 yards, trains me, got me to shoot uh, Looney from 450 yards. So I think he's a really good teacher. So I went back to Canada. How many minutes do I have left? There was, for those of you who haven't been to the Arctic, um, Matthew put together a slideshow for me so that you can see what you cannot see here. What I really noticed here is there was a, there was a story about an Inuk person who came many years ago before we got tall buildings in the Arctic. He was sent down to a big city down south, and when he came back, he said, he had said, there's so many people down there, and they all live on top of each other. <laughs> and driving here, that confirmed, oh my goodness, they really do live on top of each other, so many of them. And I'm going to say, when I go back to my elders, I'm going to say, and you know what? They, the buildings, they are so tall. They're as tall as the tallest icebergs you'll see, just by comparison. Your buildings are so tall. So we put together some really nice images of sunsets because it's hard to see the sun rising and disappearing here. Sheila can start the, oh, I can start this. Do you mind starting it for me? Quit complaining. You took all our land. What else do you want? I learned from the best. That's Matthew. Um, he says he'll give me a dollar for every time I say Adventure Canada. So you'll hear me say it a few times. Keep going. So learning in Utidut. Today, I, I now teach our own language. The language that I forgot so many years ago. I started relearning it in 1981. And today, 2000, I started in 2017, teaching Aro Inuit their own language that they haven't learned or that they forgot. And it's fantastic. I think maybe the lights need to go. I can do it. Yes, so just keep it. Okay. That's a big white thing. On one of the landings, I have to tell you, I was the gun bearer. On one of the landings in one of the um, communities, one of the passengers was going, bear, bear. I got froze stiff, like, I don't want to shoot a bear. We are invading a territory of these animals, the land of these animals. And if we land on an area where we have to shoot a bear, if it attacks us, it's our fault. We are disturbing the, the bear. So I really did not want to do that. Bear, bear, and everybody, all the, all the tourists, all the passengers, we tell them, if you see a bear, do not walk toward it. It looks nice and cuddly and furry, yes, but it will eat you. But they were all walking towards the bear, as if they were in a zoo. Thank God it was the high, our Arctic hair are the tall. We have giant Arctic hair. They have big, long ears, and it was um, a dead uh, bunny. I'm afraid you have to do this, because even though I have raised five kids, I cannot talk and multitask. That's something on a wing. Is that a dinosaur flying, yes, you told me? You can go.
You can see it clearly? Oh, you can see it. So I, I now live in the Canadian Arctic, in the Kaluit. We just got our territory of Nunavut in 1999. And my home community is the Kaluit. That's where the government is sitting. But we have about 27 small communities. The smallest of them about having 134, 137 people in the high Arctic, in Greece Fjord and Resolute. We live, we live like everybody else down here, except we don't have any trees. My mother-in-law, after moving to Ottawa, when, when we asked her, she had gone on a boat trip. Somebody had taken her on a lake on a boat trip. Oh, there she is, uh, cleaning tables. That's, that's how I met Margaret. I didn't know she was a big, famous author. My mother-in-law, after going on a trip, had, was asked, so how was your trip out on the lake? And her, down so, and her response was, well, it was okay, but you couldn't see anything for trees. <laughs> and in the Arctic, where, where I live, you'll see some of the pictures. Our trees are not taller than this. We have the Arctic willow, Arctic cotton, and we have tiny, tiny willows, for those of you who have seen it. And my joke, and my joke is, and you're gonna laugh after this one because I told you already it's a joke, right? <laughs> Better be funny. <laughs> so, what do you do if you get lost in the woods? Is the question in the Arctic. Which we, the reply is, well, you just stand up. <laughs> I don't know if this is the appropriate joke for you, but I'm sure you'll see a beluga if you haven't seen it already. I also have another one. I've made it the Inuit version of um, the Baby Beluga song. Would you like to hear it? <laughs> maybe, maybe not. <laughs> but you've been warned. Remember, I have a big rifle. <laughs> so you know the Baby Beluga song. Um, I forget his name, the guy who sings the song. Rafi. Yeah, here it goes. Baby beluga in the deep blue sea. <laughs> I thought it was funny. They're so tasty. Because when you go to the store, you don't want a, an old pig or cow, right? You go for the young meat, like not big, old and chewy. Okay, I'm getting sidetracked. That's what I wanted to tell you about that short story about my life, losing my language and then being colonized twice, but then regaining my language, which I'm very proud of. I was able to learn it and now we set up our own program to reteach the Inuit and I now will open it up but maybe we should. Just keep going. That's OK. I thought you had taken that out. <laughs> Sorry. That picture was pre-tattoo. too. This was 13 years ago. 100 years earlier, the tattooing practice had stopped. The Reverend Peck and his uh, ministry the Christian churches didn't want us to have tattoos. It says in the Bible, too, that you shouldn't have uh, markings on your body. So that practice, when we were being Christian, Christianized, was uh, discontinued. And 13 years ago, 
18 years ago, we started collecting elder knowledge and stories. And 13 years ago, the oldest Inuit woman, who was 105, passed away just before we started collecting the documentary. She had the whole body of traditional women to do this. And we, we introduced it, just the two of us, and now all over the Arctic, in Greenland, Canada, and Alaska, all where Inuit women are, they've taken it back, that practice of tattooing. We have a documentary that, that tells you the meaning and the story behind it and who should have the tattoos. And I'm very proud of it, that the younger generation are taking back what was taken away from us so many years ago. I'm going to open it to questions. Yeah. You can keep going. Yeah. Seda and I are going to sit. Hello. Is it on? Is this on? Yes, it is on. <clears throat> so this is your chance to ask Ayu some more questions, some questions about her talk and about anything else you want to raise and from what she has said. So who wants to start? Lady back there. I think there are runners with microphones. But you know what? Why don't you use this? And if you can speak directly. I'm actually very curious about the issue of religion. Thank you so much for your interesting talk. I learned so much. But the indigenous people I've met down here have been very assimilated into Christian culture. And they, you know, it's their religion now. So celebrate all the Christian holidays, etc. As people have been relearning the native languages, has there been a reconnection with with indigenous religion and spirituality and kind of moving away from Christianity, or not? If I understand you correctly, I think generally, also in southern Canada, from what I hear from the news, uh, the younger generation also, and the churches, are also diminishing. It could we could have reasons for the coincidence. It could be a coincidence. But Inuit took on religion uh, very much because up to then, they, there were so many taboos. There were so many things they couldn't do because the shamans and the, uh, because of the spirits could see what you were doing. But when you have uh, God and religion, the elders said, well, I'm going to practice both, just to be sure. So the elders practiced their own tradition and also religion, just to make sure that there was an afterlife for them. But with the younger generation, I'm finding they're not as much going into um, churches, although there's still people practicing religion, and also very much to a higher extent than, than what we have down south from what I hear from Southerners. Hmm. I don't know about taking back ancient traditions of Inuit shamanism or Inuit traditional beliefs. I don't know if there is, if it's getting more because the shamans will not tell you that they're shaman and they're not going to freely give it to people because they could, it could be appropriated. What we are more concerned with now is appropriation of our uh, knowledge and culture. So we are much more careful. Um, for religion, we still go to, to church, we still baptize and we bury people in the, in the church yard. Yeah, Catholics and Lutheran and Anglican, yeah. Is that good? The Anglican 
Hi, how are you? Um, thanks very much for your talk. I wanted to ask a couple of things. One is, what's the role? What is the role of music um, for you in learning your culture and learning language? And the other question was about your clothes designing and whether you happen to be wearing something that you designed yourself tonight. Thank you. Your first question was about songs and, and the role, role of songs. When I was just learning the Inuit culture, about the Inuit culture, we still had the elders practicing all the traditional songs. For instance, I was in Iqlulik for the Return of the Sun Festival. We are still practicing when the sun disappears for two months and it comes back. January 13, just for a few minutes in the horizon like this, like a big ball. We do a traditional song that goes like this. I sang that extra part because I knew I was being photographed. <laughs> you guys wouldn't get it anyways, whether I sang it twice or not. But the song is, I am so happy that I shall be alive again. The two stars, the two stars, there's an English name for the two stars. Akutuyuk, we call them. They're still visible in the horizon when the sun is sh starting to show. And that's a sign that the sun is coming back. And on January 13, the, the moon doesn't set. It stays in the sky 24 hours, and the sun comes back just for a few seconds. And what the children will do, they will hold up their thumb up to the horizon. And it's like this, the sun will just slide over their thumb. And I was, what we learn in those terms is, I shall be alive again. What does that mean? Well, did you die and you just was resurrected? Is when everything dies here, like with the first snow in the winter time, when everything goes to sleep, when everything dies, springtime comes and the sun comes with new life, new hope, people no longer starving, game coming back. And the other song goes, goes out on the land. Everything is covered in snow. The ocean is covered in ice. There's no more oil for the stone lamp. Mind you, it's minus 50 outside. There's no light. There's no food. 
there's no more fat to light the lamp, to melt the snow so that they can have something to drink or to heat their dwelling. And that, that's what the songs tell us about stories, about survival, about great gratitude, and about being, paying respect to the environment and the animals. With the return of the Sun Festival, all the lights are turned off and the lamp is hit so that the sun doesn't see it and get offended. The tattoos on the face of the woman are to welcome back the sun and to show respect. The tattoos on, on my hands are to show respect for the sea goddess who provides all the food from the ocean. It's, they're all women. The sun is female, the sea goddess is female, and the woman is the one carrying the markings to show respect. We now teach the songs back to the children. We teach them to other people so that we can still remember the meaning of the songs because they're quite different. They're not that kind of music. They're calm, quiet, and they hold so much meaning. You could write a whole PhD on just that one song with the respect, tattooing, and uh, traditional practices. And yes, this is my own. Yours truly, I take orders. <laughs> this is inspired from the woman's amauti. The amauti is where we carry the baby at the back, and the hood is for both mother and baby. The, so that um, the baby doesn't freeze. The amauti that I would have worn normally, if it's minus 50 and windy outside, you're not going to take your naked baby out of the amauti, right? No. <laughs> no, you're not. You, you bring it forward inside the amauti and you feed it and you change the diaper or have it so all the clothes are very functional. We, we carry them arms shorter. Everything is very functional um, in everything that we do with the, the clothes that we design. And they're very specific to, to Inuit. I love designing clothes, yeah, thank you. Is this on? Oh, there we go. I've, I've, um, mo I'm monitoring the chat to, uh, for our online uh, participants. And there was a question uh, that says, I would love to hear about LGBTQ and Inuit, especially in terms of gender and gender role subversions. Very good question. We actually have a term um, for um, same-sex marriages or same-sex. And in our naming practice, for instance, you cannot tell if a person is uh, a male or female. You, can, you, you, you will never know if you didn't know that I was a woman by my name that I was a woman. So it depends who you're named after whether male or female, and we have the terms for karyarit, and each individual before Charter of Rights and before uh, becoming a colony of Canada was much more respectful of individuality and an individual, not uh, having to conform to religion and having to conform to legislation. We were much more uh, uh, what do you call it? We very much respected each individual uh, as they were and not try to change them. Does that answer the question? And today, of course, 
I'm the only person named Ayu, but recently there's a baby girl that was born, and she was named Ayu after me, but she's a daughter of a lesbian couple. Um, I think we are much more accepting. Of course, I don't live down here, so I don't know how it is down south, but we, we are very lucky to be in Canada, I think. I think Canada is very welcoming and understanding more as we are learning more and becoming more accepting of other people and their practices. Yeah. Karen, do you have other questions on the chat? Thank you. Um, the documentary that you did, Angry Inuk, can you talk a little bit about what the impact of the seal uh, products ban has been for communities in Greenland and Inuit and why it's so important that we keep fighting for um, Inuit to have uh, access to, to seal products and selling seal products? Thank you for the question. The, the harm that has been done by animal rights groups has been devastating. Early in the 70s and then 80s, the first ban came into effect. It was very hard for our hunters and our communities. Our hunters, when they go out, they go out to hunt. They're paying for their own ammunition, their own fuel but what they catch feeds the community. They don't go to a store to sell the meat and to get money for that. They go out to hunt for the community and to feed their own families. With the excess product, which is the skin, if they don't use it themselves, it is sold so that the hunter can get money to go out hunting again. This amount of seal meat in my hand has the same amount of iron as 56 pieces of sausage. Iron, it is rich in iron, it is rich in nutrition, it is the best for the environment that we are in. The seal meat heats us up from the inside. The seal fat keeps us warm and energized. We burn a lot of energy up north because it's cold, and we sweat a lot through our hands because we are burning a lot of energy. What the seal band did was make, making a life that was already hard, harsh for our hunters and, and for our people even harder. It made it very hard for the hunters to feed the communities that were always lacking nutrition. The store-bought food, the chips and the pop and highly processed food gives you energy for a very short time and it's very unhealthy and it's very expensive. Our cost of living is three to seven times that of Southern Canada. We are not First Nation Indians, we pay taxes. So if a thing costs $10 here and it is $100 in my community, I pay 7%. I pay 7% on something $100, not something $10. We have the highest unemployment. So without being able to feed the community, we have, we have become much poorer in our economy, but also in our society. When the hunter invites and shares his food, it's rekindling relationships. It's strengthening our community, and it's giving back to the elders the nutritious food that they're craving for. It was, um, I don't even know how to say it, has enough in your language. I could bullshit in my own language. <laughs> what they have, the harm that they have done is unacceptable. And I maintain that Greenpeace and PETA should pay, compensate Inuit, each Inuk person, $1 million for the harm that was done because they have made so much money. 
billions of dollars by destroying an economy that was good for people, but also for the fish stocks and for the communities in Canada. Did you know that the, when there is an overpopulation, it doesn't equal a healthy population? An overpopulation of a species is not good. You know that, just look outside your house here. <laughs> It's really overpopulated. It's not healthy when a species is overpopulated. Thank you. Uh, there's a mic under your head. Do you see a mic? This is definitely. I'm just curious how you feel about the North being developed. Like they have the diamond mine up there, and they're going up and they're exploring for oil, which I think is totally disgusting, but that's my opinion. But how do you personally feel about the industries that are going up, the mining companies and uh, just big conglomerates going up trying to make more money? Thank you for that question. I try not to take sides. Um, but I have to. <laughs> we were just talking about that one. I've been sitting in a small in small communities where the elders the elders go and there's the mining delegation seeking uh, the input from the communities and the elder will stand up and say, "Our hands are tight." Did the federal government purposefully make life so hard by not providing running water, by not providing income, by, by starving people so that they have no choice but to buy into the jobs that are provided? Did the federal government do that on purpose? Or did, is it just a coincidence? that our men and women and our communities cannot have jobs except if they go into Mary River to be employed, to feed their families. How can you hold that against people? At the same time, in Clyde River, for instance, or in another community where the caribou are calving or the migration routes of animals on which we depend we want to safeguard those areas. We want to make sure that they're passed on to many more generations forever. What do you do in today's economy? Because we have no jobs, we have no money. Are you in this room and in Toronto willing to pay more to compensate Inuit for their food and for their survival so that we don't have to harm the environment, so that we can still live together peacefully without destroying the environment. Are we willing to do that? So, it is, it is a tough, tough um, question, because on the other side of the Bering Strait, Greenland wants to become its own country, they want to make their own money so that they can they cannot be they should stop being ruled by uh, the Danes or by Europe. So they want to develop their own resources. And we are on the other side of the David Street. Do we have a say in it? And other countries, other developing countries that are emitting so much pollution claiming, well, you guys did it, now it's our turn to do it. We have to be part of the economy, a part of the global economy. We should be allowed to do this, and we are going to do it. It's a tough one. On, the, on that note, um, I, I was, I'm thinking, oh, I just totally forgot the question that was going through my mind, but basically, now that Inuit, or you know, Northwest Territories, whatever. Well, I forget what it's called now. They they just 
they have their own government now. Okay, Nunavik, or whatever it's yeah. called, I, don't, I know that they, they have this territory up there. So they're setting their own laws for that territory. So can they not eliminate this or do something about it and, and bring back the way it was somewhat? I mean, I, I, I've listened to stories about how, because of global warming, uh, when they go, they used to go out and hunt, they would just leave the carcasses there because it was like it was freezing cold. You didn't have to worry about it. You could go back later and get some more. You know, you'd take enough to take to the village and then you could go back for more. And now that global warming's coming, I mean, the carcasses are starting to rot. The water is getting more and more. I mean, uh, just, I, I just don't know how people can survive that. Well, there's 10 provinces and three territories. Under the constitution, the provinces have a lot more power. They have their own powers that are not the same as the federal government. We are a territory. We have very little power. How come that happened? All across the Arctic, you have NWT, Nunavut, and then the Yukon, and we are just a territory. We don't have the rights over our waters. We don't have, we have no rights. The royalties that come from mining and extraction go to the federal government. The landing money that comes through ships, by ships coming into our territories, they go to the federal government. We have very little power as a territory. Um, so I would have to look into what kind of powers we have. We are, we are still, all, as Canadians, all using the, the legislation that is function, operating in Canada. We do have a lot of power when it comes to protecting our wildlife. There are articles in our land claim agreement in our territory, mind you, just a territory, that we can exercise. And we've been able to stall or stop development that would forever damage or be uh, environmentally um, devastating. But how far do you go in within those rules and regulations? Money talks, and how much does money buy, and who does money buy? Yeah. We, uh, Karen, you have one. I think this will be our last question. Oh, well, no, it's just I'm looking at the clock here. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, I'll, I'll go with the first one that's here. So uh, somebody asks, uh, I'm interested in the tattooing I've seen in Greenland among the Sami in Norway and the Maori in New Zealand. Is there or was there a common origin for this type of tattooing, especially those running down from the lower lip over the chin? Say the part, last part again. Is so there... it's a, is there a common origin for this type of tattooing? I know you described some of the, how it fits in with the tradition a little bit. Uh, and, but the question was particularly tattoos running down from the lower lip over the chin. Oh. I don't know the connection really. I just personally believe that we inherited it because when we look at the mummies, 500 year old mummies from Greenland, and you could, through carbon reading, you could see the women with their tattoos. Those 500-year-old women Inuit tattoos look very similar to the ones of the Maori. They're, they're curled, they're more curled. But in more recent years, the ones we have collected in the Canadian Arctic are much more straight compared to the Maori tattoos. However, many of the markings and the uh, tattoos were very similar. And you could see in the tools, in the ancient tools that are found in the, on the Inuit side of Canada on the, and on the Greenland, they're, they're very similar like the uh, forehead tattoos that I have and the other tattoos, the meaning of the different tattoos that we have. 
like this, these ones are very similar. My chin tattoo, the, they are the same on the Greenland mummies and in Greenland as they are on, in the Canadian Arctic. But the one I chose because we were the only two to reintroduce tattooing after it had been gone for 100 years, I didn't go for the whole chin tattoo. You would see the whole chin being tattooed all, all across, both on the Greenland mummies and on the Canadian side. I adopted the Alaskan one as a straight line or just two lines, thinking that once my boyfriend accepts my chin tattoo, I would go the whole way until he got used to it. So I was the only one with a chin tattoo at the time, but now I see the younger generation getting a full chin tattoo across. I was just passing, what a fantastic question. Boarding my plane a few minutes ahead of time in Iqaluit, arrived five Maori to my community, and the two ladies, who also teach their own language back to their own community, had moko, and they had facial tattoos, and they were all curled. I gave them my key to my home, so they stayed in my home. I almost canceled this trip, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I had already said yes to be here. That was so cool. Um, we are a little bit different, but it, it's the revival of the practice. It's taking back of the tradition. Even though we didn't live 100 years ago, we thought it was taken away, and we totally connect. I, love, I look forward to hearing the meaning of the chin tattoos, for instance, of the Maori. That's that's a great coincidence that it the question fantastic. connects to the and recent and experience. the report was when I when I came when I landed by plane to Ottawa the report was oh and the first thing the Maori saw was your picture of the uh, Maori facial tattoos on your wall <laughs> isn't that great that's terrific how are we doing for time I I think we should this. probably. One Maybe more one question. more, and then we've okay. got to wrap up. <laughs> Apologies to the people online here uh, who have some good questions. So I was wondering, there is, uh, on a regular basis, there is food uh, transported to where you live or where the people are living. And it is very expensive. Vegetables. Did you have thought about to build greenhouses where you can uh, grow your own vegetables, but which create uh, jobs for the people. Thank you for that question. There's a greenhouse community in my community, just one building, um, but it's uh, shut down for the whole winter. I Why? think it, it doesn't function in the winter because it's so cold. It's yeah, too but cold. Uh, you can heat it up. Exactly, with the green greenhouse gas emissions. So we have to balance. Can we use solar when the sol sun is disappeared in the winter and very little sun is coming? We have to have more technology that is not destroying the environment more, um, something more positive if we want vegetation. Why not give back the hunters their hunting because the food is so nutritious mm -hmm. and adapted to the environment where we are. Focus on what we have and give it back, the pride and economy back to the people is what I was saying and much healthier. Okay. This has been a very, very Awesome discussion. I can't think of another word for it. I, one of the traditions here at Innes College is that the students are heavily involved in the programming, and I would like to now invite Raven Stoddart to uh, bring thanks on behalf of the college.
Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Raven. I just want to start off by saying thank you to all of you for being here tonight and, you know, being interested enough to make your way out here in our first little storm, which isn't that bad, but it's just nice to see so many people back, especially after so much online programming and to see like hybrid programming now where we're able to have everyone in person is really nice. And I want to thank uh, AU for coming and giving this amazing talk. This is my second Herald Innis lecture that I've been fortunate enough to be present at and to uh, give remarks on at the end. And I feel like each time, um, since this is the second time, I leave with some invaluable knowledge, something that I just never could have gotten from a book, never could have gotten from a regular lecture. Uh, and I'm always, you know, kind of thinking about the ideas that are bestowed upon us by these amazing speakers. Uh, and I think that today's talk really kind of highlighted a couple of points for me uh, in such the way that like, we think about words like assimilation, colonization, we think about indigenous people or northern communities. And I think for most of us, these terms are really abstract because you find it in a book, you see it on the news, uh, or you think about it in historical terms, like, oh, assimilation, yeah, that happened a long time ago in the 1900s, but it really, it wasn't that long ago. And for many of us, uh, not myself, because I'm pretty young, but it happened in a lot of our lifetimes in this room, and it's really something that I think kind of gets put on the back burner sometimes. You don't really think about the implications of these words or what they mean for people's lives until you come across someone like AU who just has such a rich kind of, you know, depth of knowledge on so many different things. She was ex explaining all the languages that she knew, and I was sitting there like, wow, I barely know one and a half <laughs> in a bilingual country. That's not great. Maybe I should work on that. But just all of her kind of stories about how she grew up and everything, too, and how she had to kind of sacrifice all of her native language and her heritage and culture to be more like everyone else. And I'm really glad to be at U of T now when we kind of realize that our culture, our differences is what makes us so interesting. And that's how we grow as a community and as, you know, just like the world in general, to kind of have that knowledge from each person and all their differences makes us all really special and unique. And I just thought that was amazing. And I just wanted to say a couple words too on how I think AU is one of the most ferocious and tenacious people that I have had the pleasure of hearing about and meeting in my life because she really embodies grit and all of that kind of perseverance that you think about when you think of tough people, just someone who is so willing to do everything it takes to be in her community and be the face of, you know, I'm going to relearn my language, I'm going to be part of this. You can't take that from me forever, maybe for a couple of years, maybe for a part of my lifetime, but not forever. And I just thought that was amazing. She gave a fantastic talk and I really hope that I have the pleasure of meeting her again in the future. And I just want to thank you all for coming out again this evening. Thank you. Oh, we're back on the, oh, there, thank you. I just want to thank everybody for coming out. And I, I want to uh, make note of the fact that we have uh, our 2020 or 2022 Refugee Student Fund Benefit Concert on on December 9th at 1 p.m. So please come back and see some of our amazing, amazing students and staff and faculty perform uh, and raise money for the student, uh, the refugee fund. Thank you. Thanks for coming out and have a good evening. <laughs>